Healthy Living Radio with your host, Dr. David Scharf, a compelling program featuring today's top healthcare professionals. Join us as we explore the latest treatments and technologies to provide better care in today's ever changing world of health and wellness. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Scharf. You're listening to Healthy Living Radio, dedicated to helping you live better, healthier, and longer. I'm your host, Dr. David Scharf. We have a great guest tonight, uh, Dr. Glenn Kreitzberg, uh, Comac dentist. And we're going to do something a, a little unique tonight. Uh, Dr. Kreitzberg really is an expert on sleep apnea. And um, that's probably a topic that a lot of our listeners have never heard of. It's a fascinating subject. And uh, you'll really want to listen to this. If you have anyone in the house that's a snorer or you live with a snorer or you're a snorer, uh, take a minute. Uh, get them to the radio and have them listen to this show. So, Dr. Kreitzberg, welcome. Uh, I'm happy to have you here. I appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to be with us. Thank you, Dave. Very happy and proud to be here tonight, and I appreciate you having me. My pleasure. So, let's just talk a little bit about, uh, before we get into sleep apnea, just tell our listeners a little bit about uh, where you went to school, some of your training, because we were speaking before the show, you have some very impressive credentials. I don't know about impressive, but uh, I'm an uh, NYU dental school graduate. I graduated and I did a dental residency at Jamaica Hospital. Uh, residency is a nice program that helps extend your education and uh, uh, teaches you practice management and teaches you better clinical skills. And uh, I now practice in Comac, New York. I have a uh, great partner, Robert Marcovici, and we've practiced together since 1984. I'm currently in attending at Jamaica Hospital, uh, very part-time, one day a month, but I enjoy it very much. Keep my hand in uh, education of young dentists, and uh, I very much enjoy the practice of dentistry, and I'm very bullish on it as a profession and uh, as a lifestyle. I know also um, uh, you were telling me that you've reached the highest level of certification in the Academy of General, General Dentistry, a master of the Academy of General Dentistry. So maybe tell our listeners a little bit about what the AGD is and what it takes to reach that level of certification. Well, the AGD stands for the Academy of General Dentistry, and it's an organization that promotes education, uh, continuing education for dentists that uh, already are out practicing. Continuing education is very important. Uh, in the life of a professional, uh, one of the hallmarks of professionalism is constantly learning and uh, being open to new ideas and change. And change is something that doesn't come easy and sometimes doesn't come natural, but being a professional, you're almost obligated uh, to be open to new technologies. And to do that, you need to take classes and courses and, and be aware of what's going on. The Academy of General Dentistry uh, encourages you to take courses and uh, offers degrees at various marks of your time. Um, to become a fellow in the Academy of General Dentistry, you need to complete 500 hours of continuing education and pass a somewhat rigorous exam, uh, and uh, you are awarded a fellowship, uh, which is a nice uh, title to have. It just signifies that you are dentist is committed to continuing education. It's something to look for uh, in a general sense. After the fellowship's attained, uh, if the dentist desires, he could go on to uh, get a master's degree in the Academy of General Dentistry. A master's degree basically uh, consists of 600 more hours of uh, continuing education. 400 of those hours have to be participatory, meaning that the dentist will either need to accomplish uh, certain procedures or show proficiency in certain procedures, uh, not just uh, go to lectures. And after you've completed that, you'll attain the uh, degree of a Master of the Academy of General Dentistry. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's a nice degree. You know, just so our listeners really have an appreciation for what you just told us, our listeners should know that when you say an hour, that's actually an hour. So if you take an, uh, 100 hours of CE credit in a year, I mean, think about it. If the average person, say, works 40 hours a week, that's like two and a half weeks of taking out of your practice to sit, you know, to, to attend a course either locally or to travel. Now think about, uh, you know, attaining 500 hours or 1,100 hours. I want our listeners to really understand that this isn't just flipping through a magazine and you're racking up some points. That's a serious commitment. And uh, I, I compliment you for doing that, and I think your patients are lucky to have a dentist who uh, has that level of commitment because very few people ever reach the fellowship level, 
a very small percentage, I would think, ever reach the mastership level. I, I do believe that dentistry as a profession is a fantastic profession, and uh, it's worth keeping up with. And, and, and I, I do believe that taking classes is, is the best way to attain a high level of clinical skill, and I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. But yes, it's a commitment, and it's one we all should look for in our, uh, uh, when we need professionals in our lives. Yeah. Well, you're always passionate about dentistry, and uh, I know your patients uh, get that as well. So let's get into the media tonight's topic, sleep apnea. And um, we haven't had, we have a lot of guests on the show. We've never had anyone talk about sleep apnea. So let's just tell our listeners really, what is sleep apnea? Sleep apnea uh, is actually uh, means without breath. And uh, what's happening is, um, as medicine and dentistry is moving on, uh, we're discovering that a lot of people that are heavy snorers and difficult sleepers are suffering from losing their breath. Technically, in the middle of the night, uh, we all know of people that have snored so much, it appears almost as if they've stopped the breathing or they, they jump in their sleep. And that is generally sleep apnea. It comes in varying degrees, but it's very difficult on your body, very difficult on your cardiovascular system and uh, stresses you tremendously. The oddest thing about sleep apnea is in a general sense, usually the victim of sleep apnea isn't aware that he or she even has sleep apnea until a partner has pointed out what's going on and they begin investigating it. So basically what you're saying is someone with sleep apnea through the course of the night, they're stopping breathing for any length of time and then they start again. It's been seen that some people have stopped breathing and started again 400 times or more in one night's sleep. Sometimes the uh, stopping of breathing goes on for about 10, 12 seconds. Your heart sometimes stops also, and that jump up, it gets things going again. But it's a tremendously invasive uh, problem uh, for people. It's incredible that somebody could have that hundreds of times in a night and not realize that that that's happening to them. That that is uh, one of the one of the reasons why it hasn't gotten much publicity, and why maybe I'm the first one on the, on the program to talk about it because it's something that's coming up, and and physicians and to a lesser extent dentists are, are becoming more and more aware of it. Um, but uh, if you if you take note, there's sleep centers that are opening around, and, and and you've seen them because it's becoming more and more in the news, and and just in a general sense, people are more aware of their health. And it's becoming a, a, a bigger issue for people. <clears throat> What's the prevalence of sleep apnea? Uh, well, there, there is about 12 million sufferers of sleep apnea in this country at any given time. It's a fairly high percentage. Uh, they don't have a true uh, evaluation of the exact percentage because so many there, there's a continuum from snoring to severe sleep apnea. And uh, there's many, many people that have just snoring. And snoring is a, uh, gives you a, an increased chance of developing sleep apnea. It's multifactorial, just like so many diseases are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and snoring is one of the big predisposing factors. Now, I know you were telling me before the show that there are different types of sleep apnea. So maybe share that with our listeners as well. There's basically three different types of sleep apnea that occur. The most common is called obstructive sleep apnea. And basically, uh, the name describes itself pretty well. Obstructive sleep apnea means something is stopping you from getting your breath. Uh, It may be that it's postural. Sometimes people sleep on their back and their tongue will flap back a little bit or their soft palate will come down and uh, they'll have trouble gaining air. Sometimes children will have large tonsils or adenoids or adults uh, and they'll have trouble getting their air. They're obstructed. Uh, And that's the most common, uh, about 90% of sleep apnea is obstructive. The, The other main kind is central sleep apnea and that that comes from the neurologic system and uh, central for one reason or another be it disease or uh, drugs or other reasons your body is not wanting to breathe or not giving the signals to your nervous system to cause it to breathe and that's central apnea the third uh, kind is mixed and it's just simply a mixture of those two factors so in the most common type it's actually the person's own tissues their tongue their tonsils the, the tissues in their mouth that in effect are smothering them in in many cases that's what it is there, there's uh it, it 
o- obesity, for example, is, is, a, is a large factor in sleep apnea. And generally, when you have a workup for sleep apnea, weight loss comes into play. Uh, sometimes it's, it's your oral maxillofacial structures, you the structures of your mouth. Um, it, it, you've, we've all known people with heavy necks and, and heavy lower faces, uh, and, and they have difficulty sometimes gaining air. In addition to that, uh, from a dental standpoint, malocclusions or simply bad bites uh, will often interfere with that also. If you've ever seen people that or know of people that, that have a tremendously bad bite, on occasion you'll see them sort of posturing to gain air, even while they're awake. Sometimes they have to strain to close their lips. Sometimes they have to strain to open their lips. And they sometimes strain in getting, getting uh, uh, a, a proper airway. Uh, there's also uh, other factors, as sinus issues and respiratory issues. Um, <clears throat> often it's males that suffer for it much more than females. And uh, it can be a very difficult syndrome. Hmm. So would you say that... Um is it a large percentage of people who snore have sleep apnea or are most people who snore don't but a smaller percentage have sleep apnea? I like the way you described it almost as a continuum. It, it, it's certainly a continuum and uh, many, many snores are, are predisposed. And as you do a sleep study, I, I'd encourage most snorers to have a sleep study at some point, especially if they uh, fall into any other categories. Of, uh, of predilection towards sleep apnea. One thing to note is for the snorers out there, if you snore only on your back or if you also snore on your side, uh, many snorers will only snore when they're on their back and uh, if their spouse elbows them and they move over and their snoring stops and that's the end of the night, uh, that's that's sort of a less invasive, less less difficult snoring to, to, to deal with. The old wives' tale... Uh, a long time ago, and people still do it, is if you just take a T-shirt with a little pocket in it and put a little golf ball or tennis ball into a tape it shut and put it on backwards, uh, you'll never sleep on your back again, and that, that'll cure that little snoring problem. But if you have an issue where you're snoring in pretty much any posture, uh, you may want to have that checked and go, go to a sleep specialist and, and, and have an evaluation, especially if you're uh, uh, a little on the heavy side and uh, things yeah. like that. So tell our listeners, why should anybody really care if they have sleep apnea? So they, you know, catch their breath in the middle of the night or they, you know, they wake up a bunch of times. Like you said, most people don't even realize they have it. So what are the health consequences of sleep apnea? There's actually tremendous and devastating health uh, uh, issues along with sleep apnea. Um, It is very, very difficult on your body. And believe it or not, uh, untreated sleep apnea increases the risk of passing away in your sleep by heart attack or stroke over 500 percent. It's tremendous. And in addition to that, um, it gives you a predilection toward arterial hypertension, coronary heart disease, and uh, even stroke. Uh, The statistic that really shocks me is untreated sleep apnea on average, can reduce your lifespan by eight years. That's a tremendous, tremendous issue. Hmm. And it's hard to believe almost that it's overlooked. You know, you wonder how many people have those diseases, high blood pressure or uh, those sorts of things, and are taking medication, but never really found out that the sleep apnea was the root cause. Absolutely. And as physicians and dentists are becoming more aware of the issue, uh, it, 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 it is becoming more and more prevalent to have a sleep study. I also want to point out that uh, one of the things that can add to a sleep apnea problem um, is, is alcohol use or medicine use, drug use. And sometimes these drugs, and uh, they're becoming more and more common too to help you sleep in a deep sleep, can actually increase your uh, uh, predilection toward having a difficult night's sleep in terms of snoring. Many have experienced having a couple drinks going to bed and their spouse saying to them, oh, my gosh, you're, you're, you're just snoring. You're sawing wood over there. Mm-hmm. And uh, heavy drinkers and things like that will, will, will experience this issue more and more. Now, does someone who has sleep apnea, do they wake up feeling refreshed? Do they wake up exhausted? Do they not realize they're exhausted? How, how do people typically seem? Actually, uh, when a spouse hasn't reported that a person is snoring or 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 suddenly starting uh the 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 main 
symptom that people complain of is sleepiness during the daytime. Many of us have experienced that day or two where you've had a drowsy, sleepy day. Um, but a person with sleep apnea will have that every day. They'll often complain of sleepiness, drowsiness, needing to take naps, uh, headaches, uh, mood changes, and often when untreated, uh, the first sign is people that are reporting anxiety or, or, or even depression. Hmm. I would think they're prone to accidents as well. You know, if you're just not sleeping, there must be a much higher incidence of Absolutely. accidents. Absolutely. It's a, it's a very devastating uh, issue uh, for people in, in so many ways. Huh. This is a, a fascinating topic. Um, let's just go on a little bit. Um, let's say that somebody uh, maybe is listening and they, they identify with some of the things you've said. What should be their first step? How does somebody, do they come into your office? Where, do they, where does someone go to get started to find out if they have sleep apnea? In a general sense, your physician is a very good place to start. Uh, if you suspect yourself of having a, a sleep apnea issue, um, speaking to your physician or your dentist uh, is, is, is a very good place. One should talk to a spouse and ask if they've ever had any notice of, of, of you having a difficult time at night. Uh, but the best thing to do is to have a sleep study. And uh, these sleep studies are cropping up more and more as this disease becomes uh, more well known. And uh, insurance in many times is covering it. And you go and they, they uh, hook you up with a lot of different uh, uh, ways to monitor your brain activity, your respiratory activity, your cardio activity. It's a very extensive study. So this happens not in your house. You go to a hospital or a center. It's like a little motel with Generally electrodes. Generally a sleep center. Yes, exactly. Generally a sleep zone. They look like electrodes. They're, they may not uh, they may, may not be electrodes, but they look that way, and they, they, they hook you up pretty good. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's attached to a computer, and uh, you'll sleep, and then in a few weeks you'll go in and you'll get the results of this test. And it's uh, often surprising. Surprising. Now, is any physician, do most physicians know about this, family docs? Are there physicians who tend to specialize in sleep apnea that would be maybe a smarter choice if someone doesn't have a physician? There are physicians that specialize in sleep studies. Because this disease is becoming more and more prevalent, more and more physicians are addressing it. There are sleep centers and sleep specialists uh, in physicians and dentists uh, that are happy to talk to you about, about this issue. And your general physician or dentist, if not familiar, should be able to refer you to, to a qualified person. But it sounds relatively quick. You go to your doctor, you talk to them about your symptoms, you go for a sleep study. Is that one night, multiple nights? In a general sense, it's usually one night. Follow-up studies may be called for. In addition to that, depending on the severity, uh, different therapies will be tried. Mm. And uh, sometimes you'll have a sleep study to make sure they're working. Hmm. Interesting. There's various different modalities. So let's get a little bit about now uh, into treatment and the different methods of treating uh, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea, uh, as a disease, is multifactorial, and as a uh, treatment is multifactorial. First of all, there should be a thorough physical exam to make sure that uh, you're in good health, an evaluation of any meds that you might be taking, any habits that you might have that may be contributing. For example, smoking is a habit that can contribute to sleep apnea. Uh, How does smoking contribute? Well, smoking influences the respiratory system and uh, smoking also uh, will increase the chances of hypertension and, and is a cardiovascular uh, difficulty. And so smoking will definitely uh, make your body less efficient and less able to do what it needs to do in the evenings. Hmm. Um, you want to look toward your alcohol intake. You want to look towards the medications that you're taking. You want to look toward uh, how you're eating and how you're sleeping and, and where you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. Do you find that most people who get treatment for sleep apnea, they generate it themselves, or is it the spouse saying, listen, I can't listen to this you know, for another 20 years. You're going to the doctor. In a general sense, it's, 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 it's by far spouses coming in and saying, this person is impossible. Mm -hmm. I can't sleep with them anymore. It's getting worse and worse. And do most people deny it? Do you find most people that have sleep apnea, are they in denial? initially in the beginning uh, yes I mean people don't even want to admit to snoring uh, mm -hmm. for some reason uh, my wife is like that by the way <laughs> I may be like that. Uh, yeah even the concept of, of snoring is something where people somehow the first reaction is no mm -hmm. it just cannot be me 
Uh, but once they get over that hump and start looking at some of the symptoms, and like I say, sleepiness in the daytime, anxiety, headaches, this is something that many of us, many of us struggle with. And if you could find a solution that was relatively easy and would add years to your life and a general well-being, uh, it's something to be worth being open to. I think people are sensitive. Uh, most people are not hypochondriacs, and people are maybe, you know, the classic story of the person having chest pain that says, ah, it's just indigestion, and then they drop dead of a heart attack. So what would you recommend in terms of the mix? In other words, if someone is a snorer and their you know, significant other says, hey, you know, you snore all night, and then they maybe have high blood pressure, or during the day they just tend to always be tired and need a nap, do you think that that's enough that at that point somebody should see a doctor and say, hey, I might have sleep apnea, I want a sleep study? Or, is there, or should there be more? And I do believe that's enough to consult a physician uh, or, or, or a dentist, for that matter, on that. On that, I think those two symptoms combined, what, what you've mentioned, snoring, and almost one other is enough to talk to a qualified professional. The uh, negatives, the downside of not speaking to a qualified professional are just too severe. Over 500% chance of dying in your sleep of a heart attack or, or stroke is just... It's huge. Too, too huge. And you know what's interesting is people watch their blood pressure, they watch their cholesterol, they don't eat all the foods they want to eat to reduce their risk 50% or whatever, but 500%, five times greater, that's astounding. It's tremendous and it's astounding and, and it's something very important to, to be aware of. It, it can have a major impact in your general health and well-being. So we started to talk about different treatment methods. So let's get back to that a little bit. In general, what are the are there certain broad categories of how sleep apnea is treated? And we're going to talk about the obstructive sleep apnea. I, I assume that the central sleep apnea is much more difficult to treat. It's much more difficult to treat, but luckily it's it's much rarer. Mm-hmm. Obstructive sleep apnea is 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 the much more common uh, entity, and uh, that's that's what really mostly needs to be addressed. And in a, in a general sense. Uh, what you need to do or what you want to do is open that airway up uh, and and allow your body to get to get the air that it needs and your body will really take over if it can do that now there's there 's various modalities various ways to address a sleep apnea issue, and as we mentioned already cutting down alcohol, looking at your medications. It would be very important for many losing a little bit of weight and trying to uh, get your muscle tone a little better uh, is is very important for them. And uh, we always recommend that we stop smoking. But smoking is so destructive in your body in so many ways, it's it's rare to find a physician or a dentist that doesn't recommend to you to stop smoking. Um, There are pillows and there are devices besides a golf ball and a T-shirt that I mentioned uh, uh, available for purchase if you find that you're just a a snorer when you're on your back. Uh, But much past that, you're starting to talk about um, either dental devices, perhaps also nasal strips, or some sort of device that will actually pump oxygen into your body. And... um, the basic, mostly most well known is a CPAC device, which is a positive pressure oxygen that people will wear and uh, when they sleep. Now, what are they wearing? Can you describe that to our listeners? Well, it's it. Uh, most patients I find describe them as uh, it's like I'm wearing a, the trunk of an elephant. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is basically a tube that has oxygen with a mask that goes over your nose and mouth, and you put it on at night, and it, pu- it keeps a steady stream of oxygen going in under some positive pressure. Uh, many have had this at various points in their lives. Perhaps you've used uh, sweet air, nitrous oxide in the dental office and worn something like that. It's it's a light puff that kind of comes in, and it helps you to gain the oxygen that you need, and that's the most common device. It sounds almost like a mask that a fighter pilot wears. Is that sort it of what it is? It looks similar to, to the mask of fighter pilot, and it it probably is just about the same in terms of comfort, which would be uncomfortable. Is that a noisy device too? There is a hum to it. The newer ones aren't noisy, but yes, that is an issue that, that people have struggled with. Mm-hmm. Uh, statistics seem to show that uh, a year after being uh, prescribed a CPAC device, only about 50% of the people are still wearing them. Uh, they find that uh, people just have a tendency to feel uncomfortable and they don't enjoy sleeping in them. Hmm, that's amazing. And they would go back to the old way just they, from... Uh, 
Absolutely. You know, uh, you, you, but how can you move? I mean, you have this thing on your face. It's strapped to your head. Every time you turn, you have the tubes. I would think it's, it's uh, very it, distracting. It's very difficult. And, and some of the patients that we've had that come in for alternate treatments, that's their biggest complaint. Mm-hmm. They've been diagnosed with a sleeping disorder, sleep apnea, and they just cannot acquaint themselves with wearing such a device every evening. So let's discuss now, well, how does a dentist fit in the treatment of sleep apnea? Well, there's there's two two parts of uh, sleep apnea in terms of uh, a dentist, and the first is diagnosis, and the second is treatment. First of all, it's always nice to have a dentist involved in the diagnosis because one of the uh, factors involved in developing sleep apnea is often the anatomical uh, factors of a person, meaning uh, again obesity, malocclusions or bad bites. Sometimes people are just born with a tongue that's looking for spot back there, a fairly large tongue in the back of their mouths, uh, tonsils, adenoids can be a factor. And uh, everybody that's that's uh, looking into sleep apnea should have a thorough examination by, by a dentist in addition to their to a physician. So the diagnosis comes into play. Sometimes sleep apnea can be uh, remedied uh, by having your tonsils out. Uh, and that's a very simple solution, and uh, sometimes that's all it takes. Uh, ENT sometimes can get involved in opening an airway, um, and and so that way it's very worthwhile to have a very thorough diagnosis by somebody that's familiar with your symptoms. Mm-hmm. And what are some of the oral appliances? So you mentioned the removing tonsils, some you know, losing weight. I would think most people, you know, um, if they haven't lost weight or quit smoking for the other reasons, they're not going to rush out and do it for sleep apnea. I mean, that's that's a long road to hoe, and it doesn't always work. But you were telling me before the show that most commonly people have very uh, easy-to-wear dental devices made, which help with sleep apnea. So let's talk about that in the final couple of minutes of the show. Absolutely. It'd be my pleasure. Uh, what happens is you can make dental appliances to reposition the mandible. The mandible is your lower jaw. And when you reposition your mandible, generally in a downward and forward posture, it has a tendency to open your airway up uh, almost by definition. And so what we do is we make a relatively simple, easy to wear dental appliance that will move your lower jaw downward and forward and open up your airway. In addition to that, it helps place your tongue in a spot that will continue to open your airway also. There's various various types of appliances that that fill the bill, so to speak, and different dentists will prescribe different appliances. What they have in general is they're relatively easy to wear, they're relatively easy to make, and in the scheme of things are relatively economical. So so a much more comfortable solution, it sounds like, than the CPAP machine with the hoses and the mask and, uh, and that whole thing. For many people that are un, un, unable to, uh, to get comfortable with a CPAP device, uh, a dental appliance is absolutely a fantastic idea. When combined with a nasal strip, you may be familiar with the Breathe Right strips that you see advertised, uh, things like that. You can have a pretty open airway that will get you much, much better uh, uh, respiratory system. In, in the night. I'm breathing easier just listening to you. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what what's patients' reactions? I mean, when you give them these devices, and I guess you see them a week or sometime later, what do they typically say when they come back? Very, very positive. Very positive. Uh, they're finding it easy to wear, and they're finding that it's solving their snoring problem. I think when your spouse is happy, you are happy. And uh, when the snoring stops, and the difficulty in sort of jumping in your sleep and getting kickstarts of your heart uh, and your respiratory system, things are easier. We've been this is this is an area of dentistry that I'm particularly enjoying uh, because we're getting such positive feedback. People are happy. Uh, they don't even make many return engagements to the dentist because it is solving their issues and and they're pleased. You know, I would think that they've suffered that way for so long that that debilitated state became their new normal. And this corrects it so quickly. I mean, I would guess they come back and tell you that they have energy and they just feel differently than they felt beforehand. Absolutely. There is a general sense of well-being and alertness that they haven't had for a long period of time. It, it infuses their days and nights. It's not simply a nighttime thing. Uh, they feel better. They get a, a well-rested sleep. They feel better. They look better. And they make it through their day better. They're more efficient. 
How many marriages have you saved? Have you kept track? <laughs> the marriage I'm most interested in is my own. There you go. And, uh, uh, but I, uh, I would imagine that the <laughs> spouse, uh, it's a tremendous benefit to them to finally get a good night's sleep as well. <laughs> Absolutely. I like to think that I've made plenty of spouses out there happy. And, it, uh, it would be interesting to see sleep. if there's a study of what the effect on spouses of a spouse having a sleep apnea <laughs> and what their sleep is like. <laughs> That'd be an interesting right. study. I'd be happy to be a part of that. So just to wrap up, this was a, a fascinating show tonight. I really knew very little about sleep apnea, and I appreciate you coming on, uh, telling us all about it. Tell our listeners a little bit where you're located, how they can get in touch with you if they're having sleep apnea problem uh, and they want to talk to you. Thank you, David. Let me just say that it's my pleasure to appear tonight. I've had a wonderful time. It's been great chatting with you and I very much appreciate it. My, pleasure. Uh, my name is Glenn Kreitzberg and I practice in Comac. That's in Western Suffolk and I like to think I'm easy to find. Uh, my, uh, my phone number is uh, 631-543-5555. Uh, website is uh, www.grkddspc at, uh, at dot com, and uh, I'm around. Wow, a great show. If you're home, you're snoring, you think you may have sleep apnea, I give you uh, the strongest encouragement to call Dr. Kreitzberg. It sounds like a, a fascinating subject, and I really appreciate you sharing it with our listeners. David, I appreciate you having me tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. You've been listening to Healthy Living Radio, dedicated to helping you live better, healthier, and longer. I'm Dr. David Scharf. We'll be back next week, Thursday night. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Healthy Living Radio with your host, Dr. David Scharf. Join us next week for another edition of Healthy Living Radio. 